So, hi everyone. Um, very sorry for those little technical uh, difficulties that have meant we've uh, gotten off a bit late. So, um, uh, I will get straight on to introducing our speaker. That's Taylor Semgill. Uh, he is currently a research scientist at DeepMind and uh, he is a professor on leave from uh, Bogazici University in Istanbul. And uh, I will let him take it away. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, Daniel, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, robust representation learning. And because we are already beyond schedule, I will sometimes rush and jump over the some of the animations which are no longer available. And otherwise, uh, I'm working in the in DeepMind since about two years. And this is research I start doing uh, actually since joining uh, DeepMind with uh, many people here. And I'm part of the robust and verified AI group. So I will first highlight a little bit what type of problems people deal uh, in DeepMind. Uh, some of the, you know, the kind of, to give you a kind of an idea uh, of the type of industrial research which is carried out there. And uh, hopefully motivate in the meantime, uh, the things that we want to achieve and uh, show a highlight of like some uh, recent work that we have done. Okay, so uh, my talk will be, I will uh, basically after uh, introduction, I will talk a little bit about uh, robust algorithms and adversarial training with the hope that maybe some of you are familiar with that. And then uh, I will mostly focus on uh, autoencoders or variation autoencoder based uh, representations and talk about two kind of uh, formulations which can actually extend the existing methodology towards actually learning representations rather than just density estimation. So that is the kind of, in a nutshell, the summary. Okay. So DeepMind's mission is uh, not very humble. Uh, so they, we want to solve intelligence and use it to solve everything else. So that is uh, a long uh, journey. Uh, typically, but what type of actual concrete applications are there? So the two views are AI as a science, so understanding you know, how to model uh, intelligent behavior, as well as using actually those uh, methods for science is the main prevailing uh, kind of uh, applications which are currently available. So what does it mean to AI as a science? Uh, so like you might be familiar with, like in, since about uh, seven, eight years, the research landscape has transformed itself quite enormously in machine learning. And it turns out that even this year, the type of papers which come in the subject are uh, kind of increasing uh, very large. And there are a lot of mathematical objects that we are dealing and understanding actually their behavior and how they are related to algorithms, et cetera, becomes almost like a scientific, scientific endeavor. So rather than classical computer science where we were actually design algorithms for things that we can characterize very exactly. Now we design algorithms for things that we don't really fully understand. So it's kind of a little bit like this uh, connection. There are many things which are floating around, terminology, transformers, LSTMs, ConNet, etc. But you know, the goal is to kind of identify some common denominator of all these techniques and uh, to make sure that we have a, a solid understanding of those. And like some of the uh, past work of DeepMind, I will just skim through. Maybe you already heard about that. So the essentially the uh, emphasis of the company has been on games for a while. And uh, in a sequence of works, uh, actually they have been quite enormous improvements. So the reason why actually people are focusing on games is, because it has certain aspects of intelligence, at least it's a kind of like limited domain. It is good for uh, computational simulations. And it's very easy to measure performance. So you can actually uh, measure progress. And there has been some interesting kind of uh, uh, like advancements like four years ago, AlphaGo program, like uh, learned how to go from kind of basic principles, although it uh, introduced some kind of basic rules of the game plus some additional uh, uh, kind of side information. It was able to, for instance, uh, beat the world champion in that respect. But more importantly, after that, it was uh, possible to actually learn a generic algorithm, which will then master three games which are kind of related, chess, 
Shogi and Go, it's the same algorithm which just learns by playing against itself using uh, reinforcement learning. And that's actually, it can actually achieve master level performance was quite uh, you know, uh, interesting. Okay, so you missed the animations. I'm very sorry for that. So it's a, so, <laughs> so otherwise there will be this board will be flipping and you will see wonderful uh, images. But you know, that's what. Okay, Alpha Star is another uh, kind of thing. Like uh, the next step, in a sense, like computer games is a uh, a lot more complicated than Atari or Go because uh, the state space is enormous. There are many players. And there are actually much more moves, and it is basically vision uh, based. So it's a kind of a, like a, like a computer game that uh, you or your son or your daughter is playing, and uh, basically it is you know, much more complicated than chess. And the same uh, principles are actually applicable for uh, such uh, settings. But on the other uh, side of the coin, there are some progress done for AI for science. For instance, in several uh, kind of applications like nuclear fission, uh, chemical synthesis, or health type of applications, one particular, uh, you know, uh, again uh, application was uh, automatic prediction of how a particular organic structure will be folding. So you give a kind of a description in some symbolic form of some organic molecule, and then the task is predicting how it will be actually folding. In principle, this can be done by you know, uh, executing the laws of physics, but they are already too complicated. So we have to find uh, ways of accelerating that particular simulation. So it's a little bit like uh, uh, more like a uh, practical way of solving the underlying intractable equations. Okay, so those are obviously, you know, I don't have to uh, motivate maybe the usefulness of such uh, techniques, especially during the COVID pandemic probably. Uh, there are other type of problems like learning to control. Actually, this thing was animated nicely. It was jumping and doing a back backflip, which I don't want to kind of reproduce now, uh, myself. Uh, but uh, it is possible now like to just define the basic physical object and then describe somehow the type of backflip uh, uh, operation it has to do and then actually train the model so that it can do this kind of a behavior. So that's a very uh, common task or that's uh, uh, like a problem that we want to solve. Basically how to find the policy from trials of some physical model that you can actually run and how can you do it in an efficient form? And how do you actually ensure that it is reliably doing the task that it is actually supposed to do? Other type of applications which are related to Google, like improving the efficiency in processing the wind power in prediction tasks, so that kind of classical task, or how to actually improve the efficiency of cooling systems in Google. This is apparently one of the most uh, uh, kind of uh, costly kind of operations and any kind of a, uh, improvement there is actually really quite important. Uh, other applications uh, were in like in uh, DeepMind Health, now a part of Google Health. Those are more like classical applications and medical imaging, but now using uh, like deep learning models. What well, here's a kind of a idea of a, uh, understanding the type of digital generations from eye scans. For instance, like you get a scan of the eye and then there can be morphological uh, disturbances or other things which are maybe very subtle to detect. And then the model has to actually uh, find a particular disease or a kind of a diagnosis. But this is a very kind of a noisy procedure because like the imaging is never done in really controlled uh, settings, etc. And it could be possible that a completely different part of the eye or a completely different part of the body is imaged. So these methods have to be robust that they have to understand if their inputs are not really valid things. Because if you deploy these things in kind of real life, those are the type of problems that uh, you are actually dealing with. Okay, so that kind of uh, brings uh, me to the motivation for uh, working uh, or thinking about robustness or robust algorithms. What we basically want to achieve is uh, that we want to kind of develop models we could 
maybe deploy in real world settings and in hopefully in useful and uh, good ways. Uh, but now most of the research in kind of like deep learning, for instance, like if it's, it's kind of a prototypical example in uh, object recognition is proceeding and having a very large data sets with some labels and then showing that your model can actually solve this problem. For instance, here a famous uh, data set like called the ImageNet, which comes with a lot of labels. So the, and then we can now learn models which actually detect the cats, obviously the most important object on the whole internet and also the birds, uh, etc. So this is a kind of a classification. And this can be now achieved superhuman accuracy. But does that mean that computer vision is actually solved by this uh, performance? And it turns out actually not, because most of the models that you learn by this have very interesting failure modes. And it's really important to understand those as well. So if you want to, for instance, use even simple object recognition technology in health applications, self-driving cars, or text generation, we have to really understand those failure modes. <clears throat> One, you know, important, like very surprising uh, failure mode has been quite famous because it's also very easy to mathematically kind of characterize. Uh, and it seems to be kind of relevant and it's probably not that important in a sense, but it's if the model even fails in such a specification, it is quite embarrassing actually. That is the key reason maybe why it is very uh, interesting problem. So a model which classifies a particular object can actually give a completely different downstream decision if that input is changed in a very little way. And this is called an adversarial example. This is annoying because if it will be in an entirely different domain, maybe like a credit card uh, decision or some financial decision or some health decision. And even in the inputs that there are small changes which actually change the output dramatically, that is actually almost like calling for trouble. And we want to basically correct those uh, behaviors. Other uh, behaviors, if you just change, for instance, like the illumination, so it doesn't have to be kind of a very small perturbation, but some semantic perturbation. You just rotate the object or you just change the illumination. Again, you know, it's possible to change the downstream decisions. In essence. If you do these things uh, mostly just randomly, most of the time, actually the models work reasonable, but they're actually these edge cases. It's like the same problem like in testing, like software testing. Most of the time it works, but the time that you need it to work, it actually fails. So that is a little bit uh, Again, uh, this pops up in many different settings like uh, machine translation. Everything works fine with nice uh, kind of sentences. Then uh, some all of a sudden, then you get uh, very garbage out. And this is also not really, you know, like this very, very biased or embarrassing or toxic text can also be generated from these models. So that's, a, you know, like uh, those are kind of very well known examples. Privacy is another concern. You, you can actually, for instance, like uh, word, word uh, uh, prediction of the network. So suppose you are typing an email, immediately if you would see some of the private information leaked, then that is also something to, which is not desirable, basically. So that's a, a privacy uh, So we want to learn actually models which probably, hopefully, do not actually have these undesired uh, properties. This is similar to the problem that I just showed before, like we learn an agent to do a particular task and it seems to work fine, but it, is it really safe? Are there corner cases where it will be failing? Is there the walker which we learned now from data, but are there initial conditions that will completely catastrophically fail? So that is the type of uh, problem. Okay, so uh, because most of these problems in a sense uh, are uh, popping up, uh, because we are actually operating in a so-called data-driven regime, so which is celebrated, of course, a lot, so we can learn a lot from data. But any bias or limit or sensitivity in this kind of data, if you actually learn models using just standard techniques without uh, paying too much attention, will actually inherit these undesired uh, properties in the learned model in terms of bias being non-robust or non-private. So the kind of the overall picture is how can we actually introduce some specifications, if you wish, to actually improve the behavior of these models. But 
The key problem is where even those specification come from. So sometimes they are convenient specifications because they are easy to describe mathematically. But uh, sometimes they are just very operational, but then they are very difficult to kind of characterize in uh, mathematical expression so that we can make some progress. In. So just to give an example uh, of uh, like things that can be easily tackled, or what, not easily, but at least uh, uh, described easily. So invariance to small perturbations in many domains, we want to have that property. So if the inputs change very little bit, you don't want to change your decision dramatically. That is small perturbation robustness. Many tasks like control problems have to be consistent with physics. Uh, otherwise things uh, crash. Uh, monotonicity, for instance, if you're doing some kind of uncertainty estimation, if there is more missing data, typically your uncertainty estimates uh, should be actually kind of larger because you know data never hurts. And this is a kind of a fundamental property of uh, information theory, but uh, you want to build that in, into models, which currently seems not to be the case in many models. So like here, I was sometimes using like this standard or vanilla tree. That basically means empirical risk minimization, where we have just uh, some arbitrary loss function uh, that we think is uh, useful for predicting the tables. And when I tell a model, it typically means a network with some parameters uh, theta. And we want to actually minimize that quantity uh, with respect to theta. Uh, so here's a caricature of how this uh, would, uh, is actually uh, kind of working. So if you do kind of nominal training, uh, do you see my uh, cursor, by the way, if I show something on the screen? Is it visible? Okay, I'll make it look like it. So in principle, when we actually uh, do this uh, training approach, like is a complicated model. Suppose we fix the parameters, and if we propagate the input through this uh, cascade of uh, functions, the, the layers of the neural network, in principle, this particular <coughs> input specification, the small perturbation, will be mapped in a very complicated set. Okay, that's the because it's a nonlinear thing, and it's hard to characterize and make sure that actually a decision boundary is not uh, violated through this uh, map of the steps. And you cannot uh, uh, actually ensure it uh, using standard techniques. So one uh, hack is uh, to sample some inputs in this particular region and then propagate them through like, it's like a forward sampling or Monte Carlo sampling. But this is uh, still, uh, because typically the inputs are extremely high dimensional, this is typically futile. One uh, very uh, kind of common procedure is so-called adversarial training, not sampling randomly, but finding the worst uh, case scenario, at least using some kind of an inner loop optimization. So mathematically, this looks like this. So instead of minimizing uh, the cost directly, we actually maximize this in, in some inner loops, a kind of a perturbation, a delta. So that's called an adversarial perturbation. And it, of course, depends upon the ability of the solvers to find such a point. And then we can actually kind of like learn with this uh, worst case. So it's a kind of like pessimistic uh, learning procedure, which has also some robust Bayesian interpretation. And there are also techniques uh, where we can now uh, try to compute certain bounds. And this is also possible to make sure at least, well, maybe we cannot propagate this object exactly, but at least we can compute some bounds and make sure that at least these bounds are uh, fine. And there are methods, uh, this called like verified learning methods, which unfortunately work only for very, very simple specification like this uh, box type of specification. So those are <coughs> the type of uh, things. So, I just, in interest of time, uh, it is possible to, in some baselines, to really uh, get a, a verified upper bound uh, on error rate on some training data. Of course, how it translates to real world, like how it generalizes, et cetera, is again, a kind of a, like a open problem. At least we know that for our uh, training data, that particular model wouldn't have this embarrassing examples where I will be changing a kind of an input very little and then the decision will be very different. Okay. Uh, I because I don't see anyone. If there are any questions, please uh, feel to interrupt me. Okay. So uh, in the remaining time, I will talk a little bit about representation learning, and in particular, a method called the variational autoencoder. 
so the, the, the promise of representation learning is actually the following. So typically um, in those problems that I just sketched, uh, it was a supervised learning scenario. We knew what we wanted to do. So the kind of object detection, we I just give a bunch of images and then there are associated links. So this is a simple setup. But in principle now, the models are actually learning somewhat to cheat. They are learning to take some shortcuts. They are maybe actually learning some spurious uh, correlations in the input. And then they maybe achieve that in our uh, test sets, but it doesn't really generalize well. That is more or less the kind of uh, the intuitive uh, story beyond it. But now the hope is now, if you would actually learn just generic representations in a maybe unsupervised way, and I will come in a minute what that would mean, maybe we can actually do better to some extent. So if we can learn some uh, representations without actual reference to a specific task, then we can also avoid, first of all, uh, labeling the data. So we could actually learn this representation for, or maybe just fine tune with respect to some, uh, you know, like fine tuning the representation for the particular uh, downstream task. And the hope is that also in this representation, then like the way we learn it, we can also maybe verify certain properties or ensure robustness or other, uh, other issues. So here in this talk, basically, I will be talking mostly about robustness of representations, which are learned without reference to any downstream tasks. So you just learn them in an unsupervised way and then make sure that they behave and they don't actually possess this undesired small perturbation problems. Okay, so what's the representation in this context? You can imagine a low dimensional <coughs> kind of a, like a coordinate which is mapped by a kind of complicated function to some observable space. So it's a, some people want to use the kind of uh, metaphor of uh, like data manifold. So there's a, there's this, then this, this Z is some latent uh, coordinate chart, which is for each point you associated with some higher dimensional point. So this is uh, how one can view that. But uh, from a probabilistic perspective, so there's a, very uh, concrete model which just achieves it uh, to some extent. This is not the only representation learning method and arguably currently there are uh, somewhat better ones in terms of the uh, kind of uh, the uh, metrics that we are caring about. But at least from a like a mathematical structure point of view, this is probably the most transparent uh, example is called the variational autoencoder. Uh, the model is uh, should be very familiar. So there's a kind of a latent Z, latent vari variable model, which we typically tell is a latent representation and which we assume comes from a very simple distribution. This prior is actually not really that important where this comes from, but the actual model which just generates the data is extremely generic. So we just parameterize it by a neural network. So given the theta, we just compute any. So this is more like a, definition of any absolutely continuous random variable, of course. This is a kind of, you take a input randomness and thus transform it using this complicated function. And to fit this model in principle, for instance, like using maximum likelihood, we need to compute this uh, integral, find the density and then maximize uh, the product of the data points on this, this density. And this is, uh, as you might also realize, if we would constrain ourselves to linear functions, that will correspond to say the like PCA probabilistic uh, uh, principal component analysis method or the some probabilistic uh, kind of interpretation of this model. Okay, so this uh, little bit looks like this. So we have a function which we kind of like to try to fit uh, to the data. So the idea of uh, uh, the VAE, which actually uh, why it became that uh, powerful and uh, popular is actually a very simple observation. It's called amortization. So the entire Bayesian inference procedure, once the forward model is done, can be also calculated now with a neural network itself. So this, this is, of course, a little bit like, you know, if you for instance, know what the Kalman filters say, if you have a uh, kind of a linear dynamical system. But if you look to the XX solution of the Kalman field, it is again a linear system in a sense. It's kind of uh, takes, it's a filter basically. So 
this uh, particular model makes the observation that the inference procedure, the inverse procedure is, can be also parameterized by a neural network. So that is the, that is the key idea. The advantage of this now is the entire inference procedure plus the data generation procedure, if you wish, the kind of like the density estimator can be actually trained concurrently. And the, the inference procedure is called the encoder and the data generator is called in this case, the decoder. Okay, so now like we have this nice end-to-end -end training procedure, which I don't go too much into the details, but it's very simple, like a couple of lines that we can uh, do. And it is uh, typically trained like that. So you give a bunch of images and then you try to reconstruct those images up to the uncertainty in this uh, representation, which turns out to be quite important in terms of regularization. But now one natural question is, is this particular representation itself uh, robust? For instance, uh, if we, for instance, learn a kind of, a, again, a kind of encoder decoder pair and then perturb the input, how would the output look like? And it turns out that you can find, again, like very similar adversarial examples, which will change the downstream generation quite dramatically. Okay, so this is just a, you know, like a showing that the robustness actually prevails in this uh, density estimation context as well. So to see the kind of the reason why this is so, uh, just uh, uh, like, if you think about the objective fun actual objective function, which I kind of sweeped under the carpet currently, but like just to uh, sketch the key idea, we can leave it actually just a, like a joint um, KL minimization procedure. So the encoder, the inference algorithm in a sense, is given by a part of the model and we multiply it with the empirical data distribution. That is more like a one particular factorization of the joint distribution of the latents and the observables. And this has the parameters it. On the right side, we have the decoder. So it is again an unknown distribution, which is parameterized again by a neural network times a prior. So the task basically of the VAE is finding some kind of a represent or kind of a solution where this encoder and decoder are actually consistent with each other. So it is unlike the kind of like Bayesian inference setting where you actually are given a target model and want to estimate the uh, posterior distribution. This is also introducing the training in terms of learning two things which are consistent with each other. So that is the that is the intuition behind. It. So this is kind of a, like the picture of that, uh, like in one dimensional case. Uh, some of the information is uh, I cannot show because uh, it is not visible uh, on the PDF. So for each input x. You can imagine that the encoder computes a parameterized probability distribution. In this case, it will be a kind of a Gaussian with some mean variance for and but because it's a neural network, it is able to choose basically any uh, kind of a output. Like it's a, it's, uh, it's a general function here is almost like a non-parametric function. But the key point is that it is actually constrained. It's not multimodal. Once you are given x, it's a very simple distribution. That is the. And the second uh, object is the uh, prior times the decoder. Again, now you can imagine there are probability distributions for each now input set. There is an associated distribution over X. And these are like two alternative factorizations of the same joint distribution, which we have to kind of uh, make close each other. But the problem is this particular representations are only consistent under the support of the data distribution. Because if you remember the KL, because if this is sparse, this only cares on the support of the data. Basically the encoder that can do anything that it wants out, out of the support of that distribution. Okay, so that is the key uh, kind of observation. And this is a kind of like a, a geometric picture of what I just said in terms of the variational uh, training procedure. You start at two points, then iteratively uh, kind of uh, change the decoder as well as the encoder, find a kind of a consensus point. Okay, okay so <clears throat> the first observation now is uh, that this particular problem, that if you go a little bit out of the support of the uh, data distribution, makes it uh, hard for the encoder Coder and the decoder to be consistent. So the first observation was actually the robustness or the non-robustness properties comes from the discrepancy. And 
the first kind of like type of idea that we can have is, well, now we want to impose the specification that given the kind of like input, if I would actually perturb that input a little bit by some uh, amount, okay, and then the corresponding encoder, which actually shares the same uh, kind of parameters, that particular uh, representations have to be close to each other in some sense. So this is something which is similar to the specification. And I will come later to a proper probabilistic interpretation of this. <clears throat> and then this is this is currently entirely just like you know, just like designing a, a objective function. But it turns out actually, if you uh, solve that, you can leave it as a kind of a structured encoder, where you try to approximate a, a, some distribution in the extended space, where uh, the representations are coupled using a simple coupling mechanism, like a is a MK joint distribution. And this particular target distribution, we are trying to uh, approximate with a, a structured encoder. So that is the, uh, like in a nutshell, the summary of the idea. Then uh, if we get actually like into the basics of the uh, thing and then draw a, uh, the original objective. So the original objective for uh, training a VA has this particular form. So decoders, logarithm of the decoder, uh, with expectation of with respect to the encoder, that is at the data fidelity term. The second term is the prior fidelity term. So that's, you know, like the encoder has to be still close to the prior. And the entropy of the, uh, the, the encoder has to be as much as uh, possible. So that is what boils up from the mathematics of the VAE. And in this case, the lower bound that we derive with this new model, again, has this data fidelity and prior fidelity term. Plus, uh, it has a coupling term. And that coupling term has uh, an inter interesting interpretation in terms of entropy regularized Wasserstein distance. So it's kind of, in a sense, because we are doing this variational analysis, this particular cost function just pops up from maths. So a, you know, if you are familiar with uh, entropy regularized Wasserstein, this is kind of interesting because this particular metric has its also as a variational uh, characterization. So there is, it was kind of an uh, interesting coincidence that it was uh, popping here as well. But uh, what does that do in our picture, basically? Uh, what it does is, you know, like in this caricature, that the target, like the decoder distribution and the encoder distribution, when they are multiplied with the data distribution, are uh, forced to be somewhat consistent. So you see that the encoder mapping becomes, in this case, little bit more smooth while the model maintains a kind of a nice approximation to the observed data. Okay. Okay, so trust for a VAE, uh, after training, we will have, uh, you know, not much control how it behaves out of the support of our da data. So that's the, that's the key idea. Basically, we are exploiting the smoothness of uh, the corresponding encoder to get a more robust representation. Okay, so how is uh, those uh, type of approach evaluated? So if you think about concept density estimation, typically it is evaluated in terms of like test like loot, et cetera. In this case, we can use a kind of a like standard protocol for that. So we learn a model, either VA or smooth encoder using uh, our bound or the standard bound. And the second uh, idea, like in representation learning, we fix the encoder. In this case, we are just focusing on the uh, mean estimates of the encoder. We are not using the various estimates at this stage. And then we are attaching uh, a simple linear classifier. So basically, any robustness that we get from this model has to be uh, related to the robustness properties of this encoder. So that is the, that's the setup. And then we train linear classifiers on them. So that is more or less like a, we compute a compression in some form of the original data and then solve a downstream task or several downstream tasks using just the same representation. Okay, then uh, the way related is now adversarially. So this is the original test input. Now by iteration, we find the worst input so that we perturb the input so that this uh, output decision is wrong. So if the method or the attack mechanism 
fails, for us, it is a success. So we say that now our uh, actually uh, entire system, the encoder plus the uh, classifier cascade, was robust for this uh, particle. So that is more or less how we evaluate this. And then uh, in some like human images, uh, standard data sets called Cella Bay, you can define several tasks. So because there are attributes of each image, uh, you can ask several questions. So is this person bald? Is a, does he have a mustache? Is he smiling or do they have a lipstick? So here is just a kind of a, a outline of the type of results that we get. <clears throat> In the nominal training, if we train it just a VAE and then just attach it, and without evaluated without absolutely no uh, adversarial attacks. So if everything looks nice, so those are the accuracies that we obtain for all these different tasks. For instance, boldness can be detected with very high uh, kind of uh, uh, probability, but maybe if the person has lipstick, etc., is a more subtle kind of a, like a feature, which is detected typically with a uh, lower accuracy. So that is uh, the picture. But now the adversarial accuracy of the VAE, where we have attacking now the input, is completely zero. Basically, VAE does not is not able to learn actually a robust representation. Whereas uh, in our kind of like method, because we are training actually according to this. Uh, attack procedure, we can actually achieve a higher uh, robustness. So this is perhaps not uh, too surprising because we are actually training uh, for getting this particle problem. But still, it is nice that we're trained for a specific task, but we just train it for this autoencoding uh, specification. So that is the, that is the key idea. OK, so uh, just some qualitative results. For instance, if the VAE is given this uh, kind of image and we encode and decode, then we get this particle reconstruction. The nice thing is that the representation in some of the features, for instance, hair color, whether the person has mustache or not. But now if we attack this input and then reconstruct it back, actually this is corresponding to a, a very, uh, are there any problems with the connection? Yeah, it's being a bit jerky. I would, I think maybe just carry on. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Okay, well, uh, okay, I just uh, continue. The, uh, in, in contrast, for instance, uh, like if we now uh, will do some kind of a downstream task evaluation where we want to detect that this person has a mustache uh, or not, it means that this particle VAE representation can be attacked very easily because although this image for us uh, perceptually it is kind of obvious that uh, you know it is not a, a image with mustache uh, it can actually be like uh, made to look like this because the re reconstruction is corresponding to this so it's a kind of a it's also this generation can act like a very rudimentary debugging uh, possibility whereas in the other uh, <coughs> kind of setting the attack itself is now successful, but the interesting thing is completely without any uh, structure on the uh, kind of like the attack, the perturbation, for instance, if you want to fool a mustache uh, classifier, it tries to actually draw some uh, rudimentary beard and mustache on top of the image. So in a sense, that's kind of like suggesting that the latent representation is doing something maybe more meaningful than what we learn with VAE. So that is a little bit like an anecdotal uh, support for uh, this particular training procedure. And there are other techniques, for instance, where uh, it is very easy to fool for some other downstream task. Here is boldness um, detection. Again, the image is, you know, Perturbed, and you can see that actually semantically some important regions are being attacked. And here you can see the receding hairline of this person. Okay, so 
In the last remaining couple of minutes, uh, just a question, uh, should we finish in three minutes or because we started late, do I have 10 more minutes or just? I think it would be good to wrap up before 12. Okay. So yeah. maybe, maybe seven minutes? Seven minutes, perfect. So I will just sketch the main idea and then uh, just uh, finish up. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next kind of like idea was, uh, uh, so still the way we are kind of uh, measuring uh, the robustness of our representation and the training procedure had something in common. So it is what is not very satisfying about the smooth encoder, at least from a conceptual point of view, is it is still trying to actually fix a problem which shouldn't be there in principle. If we could actually learn a proper uh, generative model, then by definition, the corresponding posterior should actually robust. So we, that is a kind of a, like a side uh, effect of the fact that we are actually not really fitting the data very well. And this work is somewhat uh, a direction towards that. So in principle, we don't want to do any adversarial training. Or we don't want to commit even to a kind of an attack procedure. Can we just change our objective functions so that that is completely unnecessary? That was like the starting point. And the uh, idea is actually very simple. So if we have a, if you learn a VAE, of course, uh, it is uh, difficult to make the encoder and decoder consistent on everything because the encoder is mapping a, huge dimensional input space and it's embedding to a low dimensional space. And the decoder is mapping actually a low dimensional space into a high dimensional space in typical image processing application. So there's a kind of a, you know, in a sense, the encoder's work is a lot more uh, harder. But at least we can maybe, uh, you know, uh, do this. Suppose we actually generate data from a decoder, okay? And those are images which are very close to images that we model, we think that they are typical samples from our data distribution. Now, if we would encode them and decode them later again, do we get consistent behavior? So ideally, in principle, if we had a cascade, something like a Markov chain, we start with an image, okay, it is maybe projected, but then if we project the projection again, we should get the identity. So this is a property which is built in, in let's say, probability component analysis, because you are, projecting to the subspace. And then after that, anything should stay in the subspace. So the question is, does the VAE actually has this particular property and how can we enforce this uh, property? Okay, so it turns out, uh, you know, the VAE doesn't have this property. So if you encode, if fit a VAE and encode decode, for instance, here, MNIST digits, actually you can get all type of uh, digits. So it's kind of a, like a, like a Markov chain which drifts and gets uh, several uh, different digits. In principle, we don't want this uh, particular behavior. So it has to be actually sticking. So it shouldn't mix basically. And now what we, uh, you know, like this is the uh, evidence lower bound for the VAE. I just jump over that. That is the same uh, picture we described before. So the main idea is actually similar to smooth encoder we again construct a, a kind of extended target. So we compute a target distribution with the decoder, two identical copies of the same decoder, tied with a coupling, symmetrical uh, coupling term. In particular, we take a Gaussian, which has uh, identity marginals. And rho, rho is now the, a positive coupling coefficient. Okay. So marginally, it turns out, this is, of course, uh, if we, uh, integrate over z prime and uh, x prime, then we will get marginally the same VAE mod. So this is this uh, uh, observation. So this is our now target distribution. Imagine now I construct a structure Q distribution, which has an encoder x, z. Then I use the same coupling model from z to z prime. And I generate uh, again with the same decoder. So now I say like I approximate this extended target using this uh, structured Q distribution. So, but of course this is in a sense futile because if you minimize the KL, these terms just cancel and we kind of end up with the same VAE objective. But the key observation is that whatever coupling we try to incorporate here, okay, 
is completely agnostic. So the VAE doesn't care what copy I want to actually achieve in this uh, particular day. So ideally, if I could actually compute exact, the exact posterior, one can show that it will have this uh, consistency property. But here, uh, I don't have uh, basically control over that. And it turns out that if we actually try to kind of enforce this coupling in a slightly different way, we can get uh, actually this robustness property. So the idea is uh, actually just simple. So we just uh, parameterize now this Q distribution. So instead of just using the original coupling, uh, the key idea is actually simple. So we, what we will do is we will actually encode an image and then this particular link from Z to Z prime coupling, we will just uh, define like a cascade of a, a encoder and a decoder, sorry, decoder and an encoder. So we will decode again to X tilde some image. And then from that image, we will actually encode that image back. Okay, so that is the that is the key idea, and we want to make sure that this is actually close to this uh, to this coupling thing, which is just a very simple uh, target. And then this particular target distribution doesn't care the, about the intermediate data point that we have. This so this is a still a valid lower bound, and if you actually just write it down, there is this extra coupling term that one gets. And now we can actually train the model using this particular elbow. And by the way, just a comparison to smooth encoders, we also show that smooth encoder was taking this structured approximation where this link was kind of like a, uh, you can have it as like a robust base interpretation to that as well. So it tries to find the worst uh, transition. Uh, so you want to, in a sense, minimize the lower bounds. So that's possible. Whereas here is just the regular uh, lower bound, but with the structured uh, distribution that we try to approximate this target. And now once we kind of understand the probabilistic structure, we can combine smooth encoders and AVAE extends as we want. So I don't go too much into details of that. We can have even supervised uh, methods, basically self-supervised, sorry. So you train at standard VAE and then even throw away the uh, uh, training data and just train the model from its decoder. So basically it just now uh, trains the encoder by just sampling from the, uh, from the learned uh, data. So that is the key idea. We again uh, test this thing with the same experimental protocol that I have just described. And then in this case, uh, just a comparison with AVA with the smooth encoder cases and some uh, calling. So here the vertical axis is the accuracy on some uh, task. And uh, the horizontal is just the method. And uh, if there is no attack, more or less representation achieves some high uh, accuracy for this, uh, for this particular task. Of course, not uh, surprisingly, uh, the VAE, when we now attack uh, this uh, representation, achieves zero accuracy. So we it's always possible to fool this representation. But for us, uh, which was very surprising is that this model, which just enforces the self-consistency, in a sense, the property of the exact posterior, without absolutely no adversarial training, is actually beating even our adversarial trained representation method using the smooth encoder in several tasks. So that was a kind of interesting uh, step in the right direction in the hope for removing actually this adversarial training procedure. And it actually uh, translates uh, to now, you know, significant robustness across different tasks. And if you put even, you know, like just a kind of computational comp uh, time comparison, so this smooth encoder is has to be trained uh, really very hard with, because we have to at each time find an adversarial example and then train with that, etc. Whereas this one is just done by sampling, so it's a like data augmentation, but driven by the decoder, learned by the learned uh, kind of. Uh, uh, data generation mechanism. Okay, so this is more or less the sketch what I wanted to talk. Basically, I gave you some motivation why this type of uh, approach might be fruitful. And I uh, talk about two different uh, methods for getting robust representations. And uh, the nice thing about these methods, in my opinion, they are still valid density estimation methods where we contrary to our intuition, actually make the uh, inference procedure weaker. 
though. We just regularize the encoder rather than uh, the decoder. Uh, one limitation currently is that uh, in terms of generative models, so the decoders that we train with this procedure are worse than the standard uh, method. Maybe this is acceptable because we are also looking to other uh, uh, objectives. So our metric is different, but still uh, there is in principle not a conceptual uh, limitation. So we could still, uh, we should get also good decoders with that. And uh, there are a few other uh, points, you know, like auto encoding in SL is also an arbitrary downstream task. And we are currently looking at kind of extending this uh, framework to uh, multitask learning uh, scenarios. So in interest of time, I think it's best I stop here. Very sorry if I uh, run out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, I get, we'll give you a, a virtual round of applause. I can see some virtual claps <laughs> going on. Um, are there any uh, questions at this point? I think given that we're running slightly over, it's perfectly okay to take questions um, uh, offline. Yeah. But if, if anyone has a question, uh, we could ask it now. Checking the chat. Okay. So I have a quick question, which yes. is, um, it was, thank you for the great talk. Thank you. I was just wondering, um, these robust representations uh, that you eventually end up getting, did you probe them more? And, uh, um, you know, uh, can you uh, work out whether these representations are in some ways more human-like? Um, so, um, you know, do they end up being quite disentangled? Uh, do they end up being uh, focused on features like shape rather than texture? You know, those kind of things. Yeah. So uh, the only type of work that we have done is more like this anecdotal. So like in the smooth encoder, I show some of the things, but in a, we are currently looking to some extent like to the disentanglement where you actually try to, come up with a representation, hopefully just data driven in such a way that individual dimensions of the Z vector have a proper meaning. So if we do perturbations in there, they translate to really a meaningful physical perturbation. But there are uh, conceptual problems uh, there. So the, the answer for your uh, question is in this set of models, we haven't done it in a systematic way, but the, we are definitely thinking about this uh, particular property, but disentanglement to just get it from this very simple models is a hard or sometimes impossible thing because this VAE model that we are working on is ID in a sense. So we have only uh, independent points. So in principle, even the simplest uh, disentanglement models assume there is some kind of a structure like pairs of observations, like in a frames of a video where you assume that there's only small changes. So there's only maybe a minor rotation, otherwise some properties are retained the same. So, uh, but this way of modeling, like with this coupling in the latent space, uh, that is definitely a kind of a direction we are uh, interested. But in terms of uh, other applications of this uh, meaningful perturbations, there is parallel work that we did for doing data augmentation. Instead of now doing this uh, small ball uh, delta perturbations, we learn a generative model, in this case, not a VAE, but like a GAN yeah. style model, where we introduce this. But it is more like a, uh, you know, like a procedural description. What I'm interested in is more like a, from basic principles, probabilistic interpretation of what is happening. That's why I try to kind of uh, focus more on those VAE type of models. But, uh, you know, there are definitely work by us or many other of course, groups currently. So it's a very hot topic uh, in, in uh, uh, machine learning in general. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. So there was a question. Um, um, uh, Pierre, yeah, do you want Pierre, to you answer, answer a question? question? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm just, I was just wary with my internet connection. Sometimes there's a bit of a ups and downs, but if you can hear me. Um, well, first of all, thanks for your talk. I was just wondering, like, I was curious about the way you presented your um, 
smooth extension for the VAE. Uh, okay. You said like you want to ensure some smoothness, right? And yeah. you were picking up some um, metric to ensure that smoothness. I, I assume they were like different given that the given the space that you're dealing with. So it seems that you were using some like L2 distance in the, in the latent space. And yeah. like in yeah. general, does that have a, any impact on um, the, the result? Yeah, definitely. So the, the metric that you uh, introduced there is really uh, quite important. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could, for tractability purposes, only could uh, work with the L2 matrix because uh, this coupling term. So there are technical details. So the, the encoder structure is actually working on this pairwise potentials and it translates to this optimal transport distance which is only trackable for the Gaussian case when we have the L2 distance, basically. So it's the kind okay. of like oh, this yeah. problem of, like you, I give you two of, uh, marginals, which are Gaussian, what will be the kind of, uh, uh, the, the, the joint uh, uh, kind of Gaussian measure, which will have the maximum entropy, et cetera. So this is a little bit like the setup. And this solution is in general intractable. And if you want mm. to plug in other type of uh, cost functions, then uh, it becomes uh, probably the, we could still optimize it, but uh, remember this is done on very large data sets, so we just right. uh, try to compute things uh, as tractable as possible. So it's a kind of a, like nice kind of spot where we have this uh, analytical structure. But coming back to your question, definitely the metric is extremely important, especially connecting to the previous question, like disentanglement, et cetera, where we need to have other, uh, maybe more sparsity enforcing uh, metrics, et cetera. So that's, that's, uh, that's the case. But we haven't uh, investigated that space uh, too much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. Is there anything in this that tells you what dimension you should choose your autoencoder? The latent space dimension, you mean? Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Th this problem is actually quite important, but it is itself quite even difficult, even in uh, you know anything that goes beyond simple models like PCAs. It's related to model selection problems, and. Uh, so far, we are just uh, doing it by uh, sweeps. So like we just, because we have a lot of computation, obviously, uh, we can try different sizes of uh, latent uh, dimensions and choose the ones which tend to give you know, good results in terms of metrics. But a principled way of doing it is would be, of course, uh, model selection. But then you have all this uh, Unidentified the issues because uh, you know, like these neural networks are uh, uh, quite complicated. Even you know, for the case where we had linear ones, you know, it's similar to estimation of a rank of a tensor, for instance. These are difficult problems. So I don't have very uh, clear answers to that at this stage. So for VAEs, the short question is: we just uh, do them by uh, cross validation, basically. That's an important problem, you know, like in a sense, uh, the representation that you get uh, is uh, very much related uh, to this quantity. For the like in computer vision, probably there are, uh, you know, depending on the complexity of the scene, that even that representation can be larger or smaller depending on the, on the, on the domain. Great. Well, Thank you so much for this. It's been a really great talk. Um, I, if the, anyone has any further questions, I, I guess we take it offline. And um, yeah, yeah, please feel free to you know just send me an email, or I will be really happy to chat further. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. It was really a pleasure. Thank you a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.